Hi everyone, and welcome back to the third video for the New Testament survey course. We're starting to look at the historical, cultural, and philosophical influences behind the New Testament. And in this section, we'll look at the strongest influence on the New Testament background, which is the Old Testament. Now, if you've taken my Old Testament survey course, the material in this section will be very familiar, but this will be a good review. And it's a necessary introduction for anyone who wants to grasp the New Testament. And by the way, if you've not taken the Old Testament survey course, I do highly recommend that you do so before the New Testament survey course, just because it will give you a much better foundation for understanding the New Testament than I'm able to give in this short review section. The New Testament survey can stand on its own, but I believe you'll just get a little bit more out of it if you've worked through the Old Testament survey first. And all this brings us to look to the unity of the Bible. You see, if you want to understand the New Testament, you need at least a general understanding of the Old Testament, because they both go together. The Old Testament is preparation for the New Testament, and the New Testament is a fulfillment of the Old Testament. They are one continuous story containing the two parts of God's unified plan working out through history and coming to a climax in Jesus. And we cannot separate the Old from the New Testament without losing both. So let's start by thinking about how the Bible as a whole is organized. Now, the normal way to divide the Bible is into the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament is a story of God's people Israel, and it's all preparing for Jesus. And the New Testament is the story of God's people, the church. And it covers the fulfillment of what God began in the Old Testament. So this division into Old Testament and New Testament is right, and it is the proper way to understand our Bible. But it's not the only correct way. It is also legitimate to think of the Bible in terms of problem and solution. Genesis chapters 1 through 11 tells the problem of sin and rebellion against God, which resulted in the ruining of all of God's good creation. And it results just in a spiral downward in judgment, death, and misery. But then the rest of the Bible, starting at Genesis chapter 12 and going all the way through Revelation chapter 22, tells us of God's solution. Humanity and all the brokenness of the world is slowly being redeemed and renewed. In other words, God's solution to humanity's problem did not start with Jesus. It started way back in the Old Testament, but then came to completion in Jesus. And there is another way to organize the Bible. Genesis 1 and 2 describes the first paradise, and then Genesis chapter 3 Revelation chapter 20 describe creation ruined by sin, but in the process of being redeemed. And then finally, Revelation chapter 21 and 22 describes the new paradise, completely renewed, and yet better even than the first paradise. And then one final way of organizing the Bible, which comes from Graham Goldsworthy. In Genesis chapter 1 through 1 Kings chapter 10, the kingdom of God prospers more and more by God's gracious working up to the high point under David and Solomon. But then from 1 Kings chapter 11 through Malachi, through the end of the Old Testament, the kingdom declines and it fails because of the unfaithfulness of God's people, so that eventually they end up in exile. Yet, at the same time that the earthly kingdom was declining, and that the prophets were announcing its judgment, the prophets were also announcing the promise of a new and greater kingdom. And then in the New Testament, we see the record of the revelation of this eternal kingdom of God in Jesus. And in any organization, the New Testament is closely connected to its past in the Old Testament. You know, just, just look at the way that the New Testament Gospels begin. The Gospel of Matthew starts by connecting Jesus to David and Abraham, two prominent Old Testament figures. 
The Gospel of Mark starts by quoting from Isaiah, the Old Testament prophet. See, Mark doesn't start with the birth of Jesus, but he puts him in the context of the continuing history of God's people and God's salvation. And the Gospel of John starts with, in the beginning, which is a purposeful reference to Genesis 1, 1, the, the first verse of the Bible, which says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. See, John places Jesus in the context of the entire Old Testament cosmic story. And there are just tons of Old Testament quotes and references uh, throughout the New Testament. And we need to take them very seriously in order to understand the New Testament. Depending on how they're counted, somewhere between one-fourth and one-third of every verse in the New Testament somehow makes reference to the Old Testament. The Old Testament references show the preparation for the New Testament. They explain the flow of the story which the New Testament continues. And they show where the story is at when we pick it up at the beginning of the New Testament. And they show the connections between the Old Testament and the New Testament. See, the Old Testament was an unfinished promise. There was much that God had promised that had not yet come to complete fulfillment at the end of the Old Testament. Therefore, there was a great sense of expectancy and expectation. The Old Testament is an unfinished story. And they were asking, when will God finish what he began? And the Old Testament was preparation. It was making provision. It was setting the stage for the final act in Jesus. God was teaching his people and preparing them for what would come when Jesus arrived on the scene. And Jesus makes sense because of the history that God had previously given his people to prepare them. And now, let's talk about the history we see in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament survey class, we summarize the entire Old Testament history in five major epics. The first is prehistory. That includes God's creation of everything, the sin and fall of the first humans, breaking a relationship with God and thereby breaking all the created universe, and the resulting spiral downward in sin, death, and misery of all creation. And then the second epic is the patriarchs, the fathers of ancient Israel. God chose one man, Abraham, as the means for beginning his rescue of the entire universe. And he gave Abraham a covenant relationship and a promise that he would bless the whole world through Abraham and his descendants. And the promise was protected through subsequent generations, even when it looked doubtful whether it would happen or not. And then the third epic is the Exodus and Conquest. God rescued his people from slavery in Egypt. He revealed that he is victorious over all enemies. He formed them into his chosen nation, and he gave them a covenant relationship with him and a revelation of his rule. He gave them righteous instructions how to live as his people in every area of life, and he led them in the capture and occupation of the land that he had promised to them. And then the fourth epic is the monarchy. God gave them a king to rule over them, and they had a series of kings. Some of the kings led the nation towards peace and prosperity, and some of them led the the nation away. And the most important king was David, and he's considered the the godliest king, and his reign was kind of the, the heyday of the Old Testament monarchy. But many of the other king's reigns were characterized by idolatry, breaking faith with God, and the people were living in ways that displeased God. And before before long, God's people divided into two separate nations. And at the end of the monarchy period, the northern kingdom was conquered and ceased to exist because their idolatry had got so bad that God had punished them. And then the fifth and final epic is the exile and return. 
the southern kingdom is eventually taken captive to Babylon for the same reason, as punishment for idolatry. And the Jews responded to captivity in one of two ways. Some gave in to despair and basically gave up on God. They blended into Babylon and into their religion and customs. But some responded with hope and repentance of their idolatry, which was the cause of the captivity. They renewed faith in God, and they trusted that he was not finished with them. Then after 70 years, a small remnant of the people returned to the promised land. And they struggled to be the kingdom of God and experience God's promises among great hardships. And this is where the Old Testament ends. But history continues. After approximately 400 silent years of the intertestamental period, Jesus comes on the scene, and he claims to be fulfilling the Old Testament. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. We will go through and learn the New Testament history as we progress. But now, let's continue to summarize the Old Testament by now looking at some of the big picture ideas. In the Old Testament survey course, we summarize God's promise for his people in a few ways. One was using the acronym SCRUB, which stands for, S is for salvation. God delivers his people from their enemies, from Egypt, from all the nations of Canaan, from Babylon, etc. And C stands for community. God has put his people together into community with other people. God does not wish us to be lone rangers, but rather that we would be in a group that supports and encourages one another towards godliness. We need community, and the primary community is family. Then the R stands for relationship. And by that, I mean relationship with God, knowing God himself. And this is by far the most important benefit that God gave to his people. And I only, I only put it third to make the acronym SCRUB work. We need a personal relationship with God. And he graciously gives himself in that relationship to his people. And then finally, the B stands for blessing. In the Old Testament, blessing primarily refers to land, to inheritance, to possessions, to good life, to prosperity, etc. But it also points forward towards all blessings, both physical and spiritual, that come from being in relationship with God. And all of these, they will find their ultimate fulfillment in Christ. But in the New Testament, the fulfillment of scrub is, is ratcheted up beyond anything the people of the Old Testament could have anticipated. It's just beyond what they would have imagined. Now, the other way that we summarize God's purpose for the universe in the Old Testament is by quoting the phrase that God repeatedly said in the Old Testament, you will know that I am Yahweh, the Lord. You see, God is in the business of displaying his glory for all the universe. He makes himself known. He makes his name known. That is, his nature and his character, what he is like, so that his people can know him and respond appropriately with worship and obedience. So theology is actually one of the most important things we can ever do, to know God. And then in the New Testament, we get a new fullness of the revelation of his name and his character. And his name is revealed to the ends of the earth, to every tribe, people, nation, and language. He, he's still King of kings and Lord of lords, bigger and stronger than any other gods, and his gracious character is revealed in more depth and breadth. So watch for this as you read the New Testament and as we work through the course material. But now let's review some of the major theological themes and ideas that were seen in the Old Testament. The first theme is the idea of covenant. A covenant is a formalized relationship between two parties similar to a biblical marriage, a commitment to another person. 
and covenants were a regular part of the Old Testament world, such as treaties between kingdoms. And in the Old Testament, God made many covenants with his people, and he promised a new covenant to come in some unspecified future time. Now, just a hint, New Testament means the same as New Covenant. And God was always faithful to keep his covenants, even when his people were not. And the second theme is the kingship of David. When David was king over Israel, it was the golden age of God's people. The later generations looked back on with longing. And God had promised that someone from David's descendants would rule over God's people forever. And this formed the basis of their hope for a coming Messiah descended from David. And that's related to the next theme, which is God's kingship over all the universe. God was understood to be the true king, and the human king over Israel was just his representative. And that leads to the idea of the kingdom of God, which is a, a major theme in the New Testament and the main topic of Jesus' teaching. And for this reason, I'm going to dedicate an entire section to exploring the idea of the kingdom of God. So stay tuned for that. But now we'll move on to the fourth theme, which is the idea of the people of God. That is, the community, or even the whole nation of people in special relationship with one another because they're all in special relationship with God. Throughout the Old Testament, God promises that, quote, I will be their God and they will be my people. And that promise and that theme is taken over and fulfilled in the New Testament. And then the next theme is the universal scope of redemption. In the Old Testament, God's work was concentrated on just one nation, but the clearly communicated plan all along was for God's blessing to reach all nations. And in the New Testament, this too will be fulfilled as Jesus sends his disciples to the ends of the earth. Then the sixth theme is sin and forgiveness. In the Old Testament, God's people continually fall into idolatry and sin, breaking faith with God, rebelling against him. They regularly break the covenant. And yet God is always faithful. He does punish his people for their sin, yet he never abandons them. God is demonstrated to be a gracious and forgiving God. And that brings us to the next theme, which is sacrifice and atonement. In the Old Testament law, God reveals the way to restore relationship with him when it is broken by sin, and that is through a sacrifice. The penalty for all sin demands violent death. But God graciously provided that an animal was killed as a substitute instead of the one who had sinned. And through this means, God covers over their sin. Now, in the Old Testament times, everybody knew that an animal was not a fitting substitute for a human, but they trusted when God said that this would indeed cover their sin. And then in the New Testament, we will see the fulfillment in the sacrifice that truly brings atonement, because the sacrifice is greater than a mere animal. And then the final Old Testament theme that I want to review is blessing and cursing, also known as Deuteronomistic theology. Now, this is the idea that obedience brings blessing and disobedience brings punishment. And this was shown to always be true in the Old Testament because God is just. And this is still true in the New Testament because God is still just. But it is not the last word. You see, if it were the last word, it would be reason to despair. Because nobody has lived in obedience deserving of blessing, except for Jesus. 
because everybody has lived in disobedience, which deserves cursing. The Old Testament has proven again and again that humanity cannot live up to our side of the covenant. We need a Savior. We cannot hope in ourselves, even with the greatest advantages, even with the greatest instructions and opportunities, etc., because we are the problem. We need a Savior. Jonathan Lehman says it well. The entire history of Israel is one giant lesson in the fact that a nation can have all the advantages of a just king, just laws, and economic prosperity, but that these things are wholly insufficient because the truly big problem still lurks underneath. The Old Testament clearly shows there's no hope in ourselves, but it promises that there still is hope. So we need to stop you know, thinking of our problem as something outside of ourselves. That if just this was fixed, my life would be great. And, and stop looking for the solution inside ourselves. We need to admit that the problem is inside ourselves and look for the solution from the outside. We need a Savior. And the New Testament tells us about that Savior. Now, as you may have noticed, all of these themes and many more were, were left unfulfilled, unfinished at the end of the Old Testament. So where do they go? How will they be fulfilled? How will God fulfill scrub? How will he bring the fullness of blessing to his people? How will it be fulfilled that God will be their God and he will make a people for himself in special relationship? How will the sacrificial system to cover sin and restore relationship, how will it finish its job? How will forgiveness be mediated between God and sinful people? How will God's promise to David that he will have an eternal dynasty of godly leaders to rule over God's people be fulfilled? How will God's people be led and ruled? How can God be present with sinful people? How will God raise up a good leader for his people? What will that look like? How will God finally defeat his enemies? How will he right all wrongs? How will he reward and punish justly? Who will fulfill the mission of the servant? Who will be a light to the nations? How will God bring blessing to the entire world? How will the entire world know that he is Yahweh? Who will reveal God's name to them? How will the knowledge of God fill the earth? How will they know his name? How will they know that he is Yahweh? Now, I don't want to give away too much before we look at the New Testament itself. But all of these questions and many others, all of the loose threads from the Old Testament come together in one place in the New Testament. Everything focuses down into one point before it spreads out to all the ends of the earth, before it spreads out to all of eternity. And I hope you guessed it by now. That point is Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, the Son of David, the presence of God himself among his people, the high priest, the eternal sacrifice of atonement, the judge of all the earth, the suffering servant. The Gospel of John says no one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only Son, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. Jesus is both the focal point of all of the New Testament, but he's also the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament. So as we work through the New Testament, watch for both. So the Old Testament ends with hopeful expectancy. The people were looking forward to the fulfillment of God's promises, and that began to center more and more on a figure they called the Anointed One, or the Messiah in the Jewish language. They formed the idea of the Messiah mostly from a few key passages in the Old Testament, such as 2 Samuel chapter 7, which is where God made a covenant with David, and he promised that one of his descendants would rule forever but also from many psalms, 
where they talked about an anointed leader in the pattern of David. And also from Deuteronomy chapter 18, where Moses predicted that God would raise up a prophet like himself to speak to Israel in the future. And there are other passages, which the people of the, the, the time didn't consider to be predicting the Messiah, but the New Testament writer used them to point to Jesus, such as Jeremiah chapter 33, where God promises he will make a new covenant with his people, and Isaiah chapters 40 through 66, where Isaiah talks about God making a new exodus to rescue his people from captivity, bringing a new level of salvation. And he often speaks of God doing so through an individual he calls the servant of the Lord. And then finally, from a ton of passages, the final one I want to mention is Daniel in chapters 2, 7, and 9. He predicts that an individual he calls a son of man will be used by God to set up his eternal kingdom. Now, it would be very helpful for you to read and reflect on all these passages and many more to give you a good background to understanding the New Testament. But the point I'm, I'm trying to make here is that there was a sense of great hope and expectancy that God would do something to finish what he started. But at the same time, there's also a sense of disappointment and questioning. God's people had come back from captivity in Babylon. At least a small portion of them had. And their life did not yet seem to reflect the restoration that God had promised. They, they rebuilt the temple, but it was a poor imitation of the first temple. They were led back by a descendant of David, but he apparently died without setting up a kingdom. And they continued to be under the rule of foreign empires. So even though they were hopeful, they experienced many setbacks and much disappointment and much crushing of their hopes. And that's where we leave them at the end of the Old Testament. So this, this tension between disappointment and hope is intensified in the time between the Old and New Testaments, which is the subject of the next section. But for now, let's review. Some of the main ideas of the Old Testament that serve as important background for the New Testament are the, the Old Testament history, the idea of scrub, the idea of revealing God's name, the covenant, Davidic kingship, kingdom of God, sacrifice and atonement, and Messiah among uh, many others. And all of these left the people with a sense of hopeful expectancy. So that's all for this section. But it's not all for the important background that's going to help prepare us to understand the New Testament. We'll continue to develop this in the next few sections. And as I mentioned, the next section will concentrate on the time between the Old and New Testaments and how that prepared for the events and ideas of the New Testament. So I'll see you there. Thanks for watching.